Welcome to another tutorial video. This time around, we're gonna be discussing the payback period as it is used in project finance and asset level modeling. This is another topic where you can find a lot of articles and coverage online, but in my opinion, a lot of it doesn't really hit the mark in terms of how you calculate this and when it's useful and when it's not so useful. So if you want this entire article in written format and also the sample Excel file used here, you can go in this URL on screen on our project finance page and payback dash period. I will link to this below the video and pin it there as well. So you can get it as the first comment in the comment section. This is another excerpt from a modified and simplified version of some of the models covered in the project finance and infrastructure course on our site. So the payback period tells you how much time is required to earn back the development or acquisition cost of an asset using the cash flows from that asset. So for example, in this very simple project finance model for a solar asset, if you go down and look at the payback period calculations down here, the levered payback period is 10.8 years. What this means is that if you track the upfront equity invested in the project of just over 800 million, and then you look at how much is recovered each year based on the cash flows to equity, we finally make a full recovery in year 11 or close to the end of year 11, which is why it's 10.8 years right here. Up to that point, we recover 50, 60, 70 million in equity each year. And then year 11 is when it finally crosses the mark and we recover the remaining full amount of equity owed back to us. The payback period is most useful in asset level modeling when there is no terminal value or exit value. So in fields like project finance, many of the energy assets in project finance do not have a terminal value because they simply degrade over time and eventually stop operating. With oil and gas, you could look at something like an individual oil and gas well. We covered that previously in the tutorial on type curves. And then they even apply in biotech, which may seem a little bit different, but it's similar because drugs in biotech don't have terminal values or exit values. Instead, they take a long time and a lot of money to develop. They launch to the market, they hit peak sales, and then they decline from that level over time as generics enter the market and force down prices. And eventually sales just go down to zero or a very low level. In all these cases, the commonality is that the cash flows during the holding period are critical because there is no terminal value or exit value. So you have to look at the cash flows in the holding period to see what type of return the investors can expect. And the payback period is critical for evaluating this because a shorter payback period means there's less risk and there's probably also higher growth potential for the cash flows. A longer payback period means there's more risk. Investors have to wait a longer time to be fully paid back. And in a lot of cases, it also means that there's probably less growth potential in the asset. So to calculate the payback period, you need to know a couple terms first. The break-even point or break-even year is the period in which the cumulative cash flows generated equal the upfront investment. And then to calculate the payback period when the cash flows change over time, you take the number of years before the break-even point, and then you add the unrecovered capital at the start of the break-even year divided by the cash flow in that break-even year. And we do something very similar in the file here where for this payback period, we're essentially using a countif function to count the number of years before this break-even point or break-even year. And then we add the 80% of the year that's required with the cash flow generated to fully recover the remaining unrecovered equity in this year. Now, if it is a simple case with constant cash flows, then it's very easy. You just take the upfront investment and divide by the annual cash flow. So if it's $1,000, and you get 100 in cash flow per year, the payback period is 1,000 divided by 100 or 10. If you compare the payback period to IRR and NPV, the main difference is that the payback period does not factor in the time value of money. Unlike NPV, it doesn't require a discount rate assumption either. So it is more objective than these metrics, but you could argue that it's also maybe less accurate to real life and how real world investment decisions are made because it doesn't factor in the time value of money. You wouldn't use a payback period to evaluate a traditional leveraged buyout or LBO model because the holding period tends to be only five to seven years and the payback period for a normal company is almost always going to be far longer than this. And so the private equity firm doesn't really care that much about it. Most of the risk is going to be with the exit of the company. However, you might still use the payback period if you're analyzing a growth strategy of a company, such as building new stores or factories, and you wanna see how long on average it takes for each one to be paid back so you can say whether the strategy is economically viable. 
So that's the short version. For this tutorial, I'm going to start by showing you the calculations for the levered and unlevered payback periods. Then we'll talk about the payback period versus the IRR and multiples and why they often tell you different stories. And then we'll look at a quick example for a biotech firm taken from our biotech valuation course. We'll go through a simple modified model from there so you can see how it looks different in this industry. So to make these calculations, you need to have a finished cash flow model. You need to track quite a few things, the upfront equity, the unrecovered equity in each period, the break-even point, and the year fraction as well. So I defined some of the terms up here on screen, but let's just go in and look at the calculations in Excel. I'm going to bring up a version of this model that has the levered payback period calculations blank, so you can see how we can develop them from the ground up. Okay, so here we are back in the same model and the same file here, our simplified solar acquisition model. The first thing you'll wanna do is bring in the upfront investor equity, which is going to be at the top here. We have this area for the assumptions and it's right here, the investor equity of 815 million. Now, after that, you'll want to track the positive cash flow to equity in each period. Sometimes you'll have to use an if statement or a max zero, but in this case, all the cash flows to equity are positive. So there's no real point in doing that. We can just link to them directly from our return schedule and bring them down like this. For the unrecovered equity here, you have to take the upfront investor equity and you could anchor just the E part of that because only the column has to stay in place right here. And then you wanna subtract the cumulative sum of all the positive cash flows to equity so far. And I'll anchor the G part of the G89 there so that part stays in place. Now, if you just enter this formula as is, it appears to work. The problem is that it turns negative if you go all the way to the end because we've now recovered more than that upfront equity. And so to guard against this, a simple method is to put a max zero around it like this, and this will stop it from turning negative. When it gets to that point, it'll simply go to zero and stay at zero, meaning that we fully recovered the upfront equity. Now for this part about the break even point or beyond, it's pretty simple. We're just going to look at the unrecovered equity. And if this is now equal to zero, we can say that we've at least broken even or we're beyond that break even point. Otherwise we haven't, so I'll say zero. For the year fraction for recovery. So this is something that we only care about in the break even year. So we're going to first look at the break even point or beyond in the previous year. If this is equal to zero, and then the one in our current year equals one, that means we just hit the break even point, which means that we do actually care about this. So we're going to take the unrecovered equity from the previous period or from the start of this year, and then divide by the cash flow to equity in this year, and we'll say NA if we're not in this period. We have that. And this is actually all we need for the payback period calculations. So let's copy these down and copy them over and see what we get to. So we get all zeros here up until year 10. And then finally in year 11, this turns to one, meaning we hit the break even point and we need about 80% of the year to recover the 170 million of remaining unrecovered equity right there. To calculate the payback period now, we can use this count if function and we'll count up all these zeros in this period. So count if zero, and then we'll do a simple summation for the year fraction row down here. And we get the 10.8 for the levered payback period. So we have that. Now you could also look at this on an unlevered basis, which is very similar, except now you use the total upfront capital rather than just the equity, and you use unlevered cash flow rather than cash flow to equity, which means you exclude the interest and debt amortization, and you have to recalculate taxes based on a higher number. So if you go down and look at our calculations here, the setup is very similar, except now we have positive unlevered cash flow. And to calculate this, we start with the pre-tax income, we add back the interest expense, and then we multiply by one minus the tax rate. Then we subtract maintenance capex, the, and we factor in the change in working capital. And then we add back the depreciation lines because these are non-cash. This ends up being quite a bit higher than our cash flow to equity. If you just look at it numerically, we're dealing with numbers here in the 160 to 180 million range here. So about $100 million higher than our cash flow to equity above. And you can see the impact here that the unlevered payback period in this case is 8.8 .8 years, whereas it was 10.8 years in the levered case. This probably doesn't match your expectations. You were probably expecting to get a higher payback period in the unlevered case. So let's discuss why that happened and what the IRR and multiples can tell us here. So in this scenario, we get a very common outcome, which is that the payback period is higher in one case, which is worse, but then the returns are also better in that case. And to show you what I mean, if we just go back down and we 
take these IRR and cash on cash multiple formulas and to save some time, I'm just gonna copy and paste them up here and they should work as is. And okay, so I forgot to link in the total cash flow to equity. Let's do that. I'll link up here to bring this in. And once I do this, it should work. Okay, so now it's referencing the correct row. So in the levered case, the payback period is longer, but the IRR is slightly higher by about 1.2%, and the multiple is also higher by about 1x. So we get a case where, from a payback period perspective, one method of doing this deal looks worse, but if you measure it by the traditional returns metrics, it actually looks better. The reason why this happens is because the cash flow to equity is much lower in the levered case, but the upfront investment is also much lower. So if you go in and take a look at it, you can see it right here that our upfront investment in this levered case is only about 50% of what it is in the unlevered case. And from a time value of money perspective, reducing that upfront cost or upfront investment by around 50% makes a much bigger difference, or at least a somewhat bigger difference over time than having these comparatively lower cash flows. Now, of course, it may not always work out quite like this. It depends a little bit on the parameters of the deal and the other assumptions, but it is a very common outcome to see this sort of thing. People often ask what a good payback period is, and I don't really think there's a universal standard, but one trick is that you could look at the expected payback period and compare it to the actual one. So for example, in the levered case, if we take the upfront investor equity and we divide by the year one cash flow to equity, we get to a levered payback period of about 13.7 years. And then in the unlevered case, if we take the total upfront capital and we divide by the year one cash flow, we get to an expected payback period of about 10 years. So the interesting part in this case is that there's more of a gap between the expectation in the levered case than there is in the unlevered case. You could view this as the growth being stronger in the levered case, but actually the explanation is probably simpler than that, which is that in the levered case, the debt is also fully repaid in year 10. And so by year 11, we get to a much higher cash flow to equity. And so that's why there ends up being more of a gap here, or one of the reasons why there ends up being more of a gap here, whereas it's closer to what you might expect in the unlevered case. The growth is just not as strong here because there is no debt to actually be fully repaid or fully amortized in this case. So that's how it works for project finance. Let's look at a quick biotech example now. There are a couple of differences here. One is that the capital is often contributed over multiple years or even decades. This does happen in project finance as well, but with something like solar or wind, typically it's not going to be that long. It's going to be maybe a year or two, maybe up to three years, but you're not going to see, say, a five to 10 year investment period in most cases. You also have to make some probability adjustments because drugs could pass or not pass the phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials. You have to adjust both the capital contributed and also the positive cash flows, which is something that you don't really do in project finance because you don't have the same regulatory burdens that you do in biotech. The upfront capital becomes a cumulative or running total here as a result. We have to count only the positive unlevered free cash flows. And then in biotech, we often expect full payback shortly after the commercial launch, maybe within a few years of the commercial launch, which is quite unlike what you see in project finance. So here's our relatively simple biotech valuation model. And I've already made the calculations down here. For the upfront total capital, essentially we're looking at the probability adjusted unlevered free cash flow, which is initially very negative. It's very negative because we have to spend a lot on research and development and general and administrative to pass the remaining clinical trials in this case. So initially it is quite negative and it keeps increasing each year. Now the unlevered free cash flow here, we're looking at the probability adjusted unlevered free cash flow here, and we're only taking positive numbers. We're using a max zero to do that. And then with the unrecovered capital line, this is a similar concept where we take the upfront total capital and we subtract the unlevered free cash flow so far, the cumulative sum, except here it increases in the first few years. And then once the product is launched, which happens in year five in this case and goes through the next few years after that, then this starts decreasing and we hit the break-even point in year seven. Now the break-even point or beyond formula and the year fraction for recovery formulas, those are all basically the same as what you saw in the project finance example. But in this case, we get to a much shorter payback period. I wouldn't say this is typical of biotech. It depends on what stage you're analyzing the company. In this case, one of the reasons why it's shorter is that 
The company was already in phase two clinical trials, and there was a question about whether they would succeed or not, but they had already been through phase one and made it past that. So in this case, it looks like a much shorter period, but ultimately it depends on where the company is in its clinical trials and product development process. So I wouldn't say this is a universal result that the payback period tends to be shorter for biotech than it is in other fields. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. I showed you how to calculate the levered and unlevered payback periods. The bottom line is that you need to track a couple of things in Excel, including the upfront capital or equity, the positive cash flows to equity or positive cash flows to all investors, the unrecovered equity or capital calculated by taking that upfront amount and then subtracting the positive numbers, the sum of the positive cash flows generated over time. You need to track whether you're on the break even point or not. And then at the end, to get the levered payback period, you have to add up all the years before the break even point and then add the fraction of the year in that break even period required to get you to exactly break even and recover all the capital. After that, I showed you why the payback period and the IRRs and multiples often tell you different stories. The bottom line is that they're just measuring different things. And the IRR multiples are more about the returns and the upside of the project and what the annualized results look like in the case of the IRR. The payback period is more about measuring some of the risk of the project and also the growth potential of the cash flows. And then we looked at the biotech example quickly. The main differences are the need to track that cumulative balance of capital invested. Also, they need to probability adjust both the capital invested and the cash flows, depending on how clinical trials go. So that's it for this lesson. Hopefully now you learned a little bit more about the payback period and how you can use it in different contexts to analyze deals and potential investments and look at the risk and also the growth potential.